Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. You're very welcome, Mac. Joe Malloy with you this afternoon. We are reviewing the Sunday papers. Ryle Nugent and Dan McDonald with us. Dan, we had some technical issues just before the break. Hopefully we're good to go. I was just asking you on the Gordon Elliott story then, which is everywhere, as you can imagine, across the Sunday papers. Broad overview, what's your sense of the coverage? Yeah, well, there's, there's two sides to it, Joe. I mean, there's obviously uh, there's some people like Sunday columnists who are probably having their first hit at it to some degree. Um, and then there's probably aspects of the coverage itself, the story itself, which is moving on. The guy picked up the Racing Post, for example, and, and that's you know almost completely moved on to the issue of uh, Denise Foster coming in to take over the yard and almost looking ahead and... and you know, they've obviously been living the story every day for the week, so things are sort of moving on there, whereas for some columnists, it's their first shot at it. Um, and, and to be fair, it's probably been covered in such depth. I mean, there's some, some good pieces out there, but because it's been covered in such depth across the week, um, you know, I guess a lot of it is almost coming around to consensus view at this stage. Um, you know, a, a general tone across various pieces, Eamon Sweeney, um, Roy Curtis, Shane McGrath, slightly different. Shane McGrath more so on maybe the welfare side of things, but but still a lot of it coming back around to the view that you know Gordon Elliott has has got a punishment. Maybe the over the, a lot of the initial reaction might have been over the top, um, and the, the the general theme of you know the the uh, attack on him and maybe did it go too far. Um, but I think you know it's it, I think people are, I think people have probably reached that view almost. I think the news cycle have probably reached that by Wednesday Thursday anyway. I feel. But there's still some pieces making that point today. But I did think the most interesting stuff was probably uh, the Sunday Times stuff, to be honest. The David Walsh column on the back page of the Sunday Times and then a Dennis Walsh piece inside, just from two different perspectives. David Walsh's column, just journalistic point of view. I mean, he's, he's obviously writing for the English Sunday Times, but it's carried in the Irish edition, but obviously pretty geared towards the UK audience. And his piece goes into the general issue of um, welfare of horses. And... Um, you know, the, the, uh, it, it takes the debate in a slightly different way. And I think it's a good piece. It's, 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 it's giving a voice to a, probably another point of view um, from Maddie, Maddie Doyle is the name of the person he speaks to. She's a volunteer for the Kildare branch of My Lovely Horse, a welfare charity that rescues abandoned horses. Just talking to her about some of her experiences, including an instance in, I think, 2018, a member of the public contacting her... Uh, the, the organisation saying they'd spotted a number of horses wandering in a, a wooded area in County Kildare. Uh, race horses have microchips inserted in them, which means that they can be identified. And while most of the horses, the strays they pick up aren't ex race horses, in this case, it did have a couple of race horses. And that is the in introduction to a, a, a piece that talks about the need for racing to do more, perhaps from a welfare, welfare point of view. Now, it is aimed towards a, a UK audience, as I said. But I think this is a relevant point. Like I wrote about this story during the week, and I'm coming at it from the perspective of, you know, a massive racing fan, and um, you know, someone who's owned horses like a, a sort of very low level in, in syndicates and stuff like that. You know, quite a few horses, and you know, I love the game, I love the sport. But obviously, you, you go into the game with your eyes open. You go into the sport with your eyes open. If you're a fan of it, like you know that that you know horses dying is a is a part of it. Um, and I, you also have to appreciate that some people you know, will feel very uncomfortable about that. And you have to accept that it's almost like a pact that you enter into. It's the price you pay. And it's not always going to be for everyone. Um, but I, I think in the, in, the, in the backlash, I suppose, to the backlash, you know, the point has been made uh, that you know, these horses get you know, terrific care and love and they get looked after. And Elliot Poe's going to, you know, it was just such a stupid thing to do. I think there's sort of unanimity on that, I think, at this stage. But the broader point is that the horses are very well looked after. But to be fair, David Walsh does raise a valid point that still there are probably questions that have to be raised about what happens horses when they finish racing. Um, I, I didn't actually write about it in the piece I did during the week, but I was going to refer to it in Australia a year or two back. There was a big uh, sort of a panorama style investigation into uh, the number of ex race horses that ended up going to sort of abattoirs and how they were treated. And it was very shocking for the Australian public and Australia's attitude towards racing is, um, you know, it's, it's very different to maybe over here. Jumps racing is banned in several states. And there is like a feeling that maybe the UK, there is certainly a lobby pushing that way. And, and, and this piece by David Walsh, I think, backs up the point that really, you know, racing has to be on top of everything because, you know, from the sort of welfare perspective, um, 
that, you know, if there are sort of aberrations, and as he makes the point, I think, you know, the discovery of um, these horses in 2018 wasn't a one-off. There was 11 abandoned horses in Cork three months later, and another unfortunate one-off. And I think there's like a lot of eyes on the sport right now. And I just think it's a good piece in terms of, listen, explaining that there are other issues, yeah. you know, in welfare that need to be touched on. Also touches on uh, sort of the medicalization of horse racing, the use of sort of uh, anti-inflammatories and, and legal uh, performance enhancing drugs and, and what that says about welfare. But that's obviously tailored towards the UK audience. Dennis Walsh piece is more about the owners and how they save yeah. Gordon Elliott. That's interesting stuff. Yeah, the byline on Walsh's piece is look beyond Elliot's callous pose and you'll find stories of neglect of abandoned racehorses. The authorities must do more about welfare. It's interesting that one of those abandoned horses turns out to be War Celeste. Uh, five years before, she had been um, bought for 254,000 uh, guineas and they nursed her back to health. Several of the horses they found had to be euthanized, but they nursed her back to health and... Uh, the Maddie, who works for My Lovely Horse, said, I just thought, wow, she's the most beautiful an animal. And 10 or more breeders uh, pleaded for the opportunity to adopt the mare with a view to putting her in foal. Some offered generous donations to the charity, but we thought, no, racing had its chance with War Celeste. It only wanted her back because there was, again, the chance of making money from her. And then Walsh finishes by saying, Gordon Elliott's unthinking callousness has reminded racing authorities of its responsibilities. What a shame it would be if the sport didn't learn from it. You were coming in there, Rob. Yeah, I I think, you know, Dan's point is well made. There's been a a lot of coverage. I think a couple of things. One, you you would need to be a working journalist in it to keep on top of everything that's been said and what's that's been written. So so all the papers give you a decent overview. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, this weekend about about what's happened, where it's at, and where it's uh, potentially going. There are so many layers to this. I've flip flopped on this all week in in my own sense of what's of of where it is and and where it's going. Um, I, I thought the moral outrage stuff halfway through the week uh, was was beyond my comprehension. I mean, uh, in terms of moral outrage, you look at things that have happened in Irish sport in the last twelve months, and then you contextualise this and the reaction to it, and you wonder how we've gotten to where we've gotten. I mean, with with the exception of the John Delaney FAI story, I, I can't think of another story that's just gone through as much newspaper print and uh, airwaves on both TV and radio as, as this story has. And yet you, you, you think of the moral outrage that should be uh, looked at in terms of even the John McLean story in, in, in the uh, Indo today, brilliantly done by Brendan Fanning, and I know we're going to get to that, and, and, and the racism against young athletes in this country and, and the gangland money and MTK uh, and, and the, the association with professional boxing and... And 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 you can go back to the wonderful work done on the on the George Gibney story by by uh, Mark Horgan and the team, and and still we have no answers as to how we ended up there, and and what's been done to address the issue that that we still aren't in a position to have 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 George Gibney come back and answer the charges. So mm. so there are there are a myriad of of issues in Irish sport, and yet the moral outrage around this story, and I understand part of it because there's a simplicity to the story in that man on horse doing what he shouldn't be doing unequivocally wrong and should be punished. And yet we, we, we're still here a week later and we're still talking about it. I think what it has done is it, it's, it's now brought on another layer, which is racing, looking at itself in all its, uh, and all its issues. And, and with that in mind, the Sunday business post on pages 18 and 19 do a really good job of, of putting the, the Gordon Elliott story in the middle of all the issues that are there for racing right now, both in Ireland and in the UK. Um, and it's written by uh, Aaron Rogan and, and Barry White. And, and then there's also a piece from a man from this parish, from Johnny Ward, um, and, and all very, very good uh, in terms of, of giving you a sense of, of what the industry is facing and the concerns and the worries that those in it have and those from the outside looking in are, are asking itself. I do have to say one other thing on mm -hmm. it. I'm really surprised at the, the lack of reaction so far to the to the statement made by Gordon Elliott Racing. Um, and it's there, uh, you quoted it earlier, um, on the front page of the Sunday Independent. Um, Denise is a vast experience and her appointment is great news for staff and owners. Gordon will be available to assist her as she requires. Now, like, uh, the communications around Gordon Elliott's 
uh, press releases at times have been uh, right up there with uh, what's gone on with government and, and COVID vaccines. Uh, it, it's been shambolic. And, and that, that statement has since been readjusted online to remove that line. I mean, I mean Paul Hayward, who's a, a very well-renowned uh, journalist in the UK, he's got 250,000-odd followers on Twitter. His reaction to that statement was, oh, dear, Gordon will be available to assist her as she requires. That's not a ban. It's a flag of convenience. I'd be surprised if Cheltenham, et cetera, accept that. And it's not an unreasonable point. Like the first reaction of Gordon Elliott to the to the publishing of the photograph was was not a good look in terms of the statement that was made. I had a sense as the week progressed and the other statements came out that there was a genuine belief that he understood what damage he'd done here. Mm. And then you get a communication like this that then is readjusted. And you have to say to yourself, like, like what is going on here? Mm. Uh, because because. Paul, Paul Hayward's right. Like, that is a flag of convenience. If Gordon Elliott is just going to put somebody else in and continue to do the job, racing is going to have an even bigger problem in a week's time because Cheltenham is coming and that, that floodlight will be, will be on, on the situation again. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to comment on that because it's interesting. I, I thought the story had run its course to some degree, but uh, it's just interesting this morning watching the, the racing TV. Nick Luck, the broadcaster, is his show. And there was a race, a senior racing post journalist on it, still arguing that, that Gordon Elliott's horses, inverted commas, who would be now Denise Foster's horses, shouldn't be allowed to run at the Cheltenham Festival. Or not that they shouldn't be allowed to run, that they should be pulled out. It was not necessarily looking for a decree, more so looking that they would voluntarily sign out. Now, that's, I think there's been a pretty angry reaction to that, you know, because, I mean, it would be very unfair on the owners, you know, staff, people in the yard have done very little wrong. But again, it, it exposes the fact that it's it's a UK reaction uh, to it, and they're probably fearing that if there is a winner for um, you, know, you know the Denise Foster trained horse, um, that 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 will cause a storm. You know, and, and it does seem that would be the case. I mean, we have a situation where you know uh, you know Charles Burns is starting a ban for a very separate uh, separate instance. Uh, one of his old horses won the other night in the same colours, ridden by his son, but under a different trainer's name, um, who has now taken over the care of his horses. And, and that just raises people's questions as to the extent to which, well, you know, there's still a, a visibility from the, uh, the, you know, the, the old trainer who is supposed to be at the game at the moment. And, like, I, I suppose we all probably deep down, we all know that if, the, you know, that Denise Foster is in there, of course, she, like, you know, animals are creatures of habit. And of course, she will be ringing Gordon Elliott to talk about these animals. That's a normal thing we would expect to happen. But that probably shines a, a light on, are people happy with the, the punishment? No, I actually thought the ban was perfectly fair. I think the ban was a very reasonable and fair punishment. But there's certainly, again, it comes back to optics and the optics of how to hand over uh, to someone else taking over the yard. It's going to be scrutinised pretty closely, you would have to say, and, and shows that maybe there's the story isn't 100% gone away and it perhaps in a way that I thought it might because, yeah, maybe in Cheltenham, if Denise Foster has the three or four winners, um, maybe we're coming back to this topic again. I've seen yeah, a few. Yeah, I, 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 a I agree for what it's yeah, worth. I, okay. I just, I think it's worth saying, I, I, I think that the optics of this are all wrong uh, and, and, and they need to be really, really careful about what they say and how they say it and what actually happens in the, in the coming uh, couple of weeks. And, and you add that statement, Cheltenham coming, and the uh, the inference in the uh, in the IHRB or not the inference, the statement in the IHRB ruling that that there was a there was a trend here towards uh, Gordon being set up uh, to be ruined, mm -hmm. and 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 that brings its own questions as well. You 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 wonder uh, will will we still be talking about this in a week's time or two weeks time or part of this story? And I think the answer to that is yes. Certainly the Denise Foster and he'll be assisting her angle is bigger in the UK than it is here at the moment. We'll have to see how that all plays out. I think there's probably a wider sense that even if he is assisting or helping out, he's suffered enough. And yeah. that's probably part of people's thinking. Like I, on Monday, I would hold my hands up. I was very critical of the statement. I thought the statement had to be criticised. I didn't think it could just be accepted as, you know, this is the explanation 
of events and I you know, agree with you by the way on that 100% right 100% and I, I didn't feel good about doing that actually you know I felt, felt um, I, as I watched the week unfold I thought oh you know he's having such a horrible time but the initial statement was just we, we couldn't uh, just say oh well, that's fair enough if that's what happened because it didn't ring uh, true but as the week transpired Chibli stood on Tuesday is a massive blow and I mean it was amazing on social media in particular people were saying well he should be banned for life and the thing was getting out of hand and on Monday even with the only statement at that stage saying well it was you know we're misreading the picture even on Monday we made the point here that there should still be forgiveness there should still be a redemption and my, my sense of that increased across the week um, and so I think with the Chiefly Stud stuff just with the size of the story and the extent to which now Elliot will always be associated with that photo by the time Friday came around, I think a lot of people felt, well, like, the ban is almost incidental. And, yes, it's six months. Stan, you know you're racing more than me. I mean, I read that as well. You know, it's, it's akin to a two- or three-month ban because things wind down in the summer anyway, and he's back in yeah. August. And so yeah. there's probably, we, we probably have reached a point where what, what is the value of endangering his livelihood, the livelihood of the 80 staff? And if Denise Foster coming in and being assisted by Elliot keeps the show on the road, keeps owners happy. I mean, like, what, what, what do we want here? We, we, can't, we can't run the whole thing into the ground. That wouldn't be appropriate for the crime, you know? Yeah, no, Eamon I, Sweeney. Sorry, sorry, Dan, you go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, I mean, and I'll let Ryle go back in on that as well. Like, it, it is true. I, I think, you know, there, it, like, as I said, as a racing fan, like, you know, so much of racing, there's a sort of, sort of a nod and wink aspect to a lot of things, you know? Like, mm. you sort of know there's a lot of things about the sport it isn't perfect you know you, you, you know there's, there's a broader issue of like you know you can talk about non-trying horses and races and all, all sorts of issues with racing that there's quirks of the sport that that people involved in it are sort of aware of it and you know it, that that this one episode became um got to the stage where this is the one where we need the strong sanction from the authorities that's where i think it lost you know, there was that initial anger that a lot of people felt, probably even including, like, I probably felt it myself on Monday, but I think across the week, people have realised, well, racing has other issues it needs to look at in terms of its, you know, regulation, you know, and, you know, even the fact that we, and I'm doing it myself, I'm guilty of it, like, I'm framing it so much in the context of, well, how they're viewing it in the UK and Britain, and I think it's, you know, Johnny Ward points out in his piece in the Business Post today, he does have the trainer, Brendan Duke, pointing out that the British Horse Racing Authority in England are wading into this topic with relish yeah. because it's, as, a, as the simplicity to it has almost, as, as Royal says, yeah, you know, the, the issue around Sheikh Mohammed, the panorama documentary, is hard to sort of explain it in 30 seconds, but obviously there's a sort of a broader issue of like um, a, a, a murky situation around his daughter. And he's still someone who bankrolls the sport in the UK considerably. And really, until in the racing post yesterday, there was a brief comment from the new BHA head. They haven't really addressed that issue at all, yet the Gordon Elliott photo, they've almost got stuck into it. And there's a lot of other things in racing that you know you would you would think that if you go down the road of coming down really, really hard on this, like where do you stop? And I think that that's part of the um that's part of the way that racing has been wrestling with itself this week, I believe, as well, too, because you know it's by far from a perfect world. And I think people are maybe thinking this photo really isn't like it, there's a public perception that comes with it, but there's obviously other problems the sport faces that are probably arguably far more serious. Yeah, and with that in mind, I think pages 18 and 19 of the Sunday Business Post do the job of putting it all in context for you. Mm. Is this a, is, the, the current ban? I mean, it's akin to a touchline ban for a manager. Like, is that not fair enough? Well, I mean, like, yeah, like, I think the ban is completely fair. I mean, I, th I think it's just a, a case of, like, you know, a manager gets a touchline ban and you still know he's on the he's on the phone to the assistant on the bench, yeah. you know. And but but I think, you know, I, I like Gordon Elliott has still lost, you know, the Chievely Power courses, including, um, you know, Envoy Allen, and they're not coming back, you know, as far as we can see, you know. And that is, uh, to me, like, that is a, a serious blow. Um, and I, that's why just to, to go back to the papers aspect, the Dennis Walls piece is is quite good because it, it details like even the support of Giggins Ten and Michael O'Leary from a longer term perspective is isn't that relevant because they're they're pulling back out of the sport. But uh, it points out that the the key part of this week behind the scenes was the 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 Morins. It's a new family, Noel and, and Valerie Morin, uh, who effectively are, are new money in the sense that they started from nothing ten years ago 
and built up a, a company called Prepaid Financial Services uh, for a windfall of uh, 266 million euros. They sold it. They sponsored the yard. They've come in and they're a big, they're a big sort of player. And their their decision to stand by Gordon Elliott, I think, is like a key part of the week and a key part of his future. Like there was a possibility during the week that like that the other owners would have all followed suit from Chievely Park and pulled out, and then he would have been destroyed, really. You know, in terms of everything he made up. But uh, but he still has suffered. He's lost some good horses. His name is you know is is tainted a bit. You know, from from this or certainly in, in a lot of people's eyes, it will be permanently that view will be held. Mm. Um. But he's missing a whole year of festivals, um, and he'll come back, as you mentioned, like you'll miss Galway, but really national hunt-wise, he comes back next September. But I don't know how you can manage the ban in any way. As you say, the touchline ban is an interesting point, because unless you get someone to completely go to a different country or something and leave the sport completely, like, of course, he's going to be around and yeah. offering some insight. And you could all go to argue, by the way, if you're talking about welfare being the bottom line here, you know, someone who intimately knows the personality of the horses possibly in a, in a way was always going to be offering advice rather than a trainer coming in mm. and uh, doing their own thing, which could in some respects like have some sort of a, you know, yeah. damaging impact, you yeah. know, so you can, yeah. you can take that point to its natural end. You can yeah. argue it both ways. Okay. Well, we should, we should move on because we can labor this point. Although the coverage is extensive, as you mean, I was wondering, will we get a blow by blow account of the hearing on Friday? We don't really. I mean, no. Dennis Walsh makes the point, although this is in the, I H or B statement that Elliot offered, quote, no credible explanation to us. And Dennis Walsh makes the point this should have been Elliot's public position from the beginning. I think I think that Monday statement, Ryle, as you said, didn't help. You know, it just when, when the only dispatch was one that people just didn't buy. It was just but, the but wrong even, thing to do. Even, you just even in it, Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. But even in addition to that, Joe, like having a statement where you where and I, and I absolutely accept that no one believed that Gordon Elliott was going to disappear behind a rock for the next six months and not have any engagement with uh, with the, the 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 training or the involvement with his horse with the horses that are under his care. However, along with that statement on Monday, you now have a statement again that was made last night that has had to be tweaked because it wasn't the optics of it and the messaging around it were going to be interpreted in such a way that the story wouldn't go away. Yeah. And 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 I don't know who's having those discussions with him about his communications, yeah. but they need to stop. <laughs> yeah, he was let down on Monday, I think. I mean, I'm sure he yeah, took I agree. advice. And, and however it was concocted, I mean, it was just not the right way. And it was funny when he himself spoke to David Jennings after and it was just a look, it's a moment of madness. That's, you know, suddenly the, the, the kind of honesty comes out and everyone can kind of say, well, okay, I mean, geez, we've all had them. Yeah. We've all had them. A absolutely. A a absolutely. Okay, we'll move on. Um, uh, Tom Fox says, brilliant stuff by Ron Nugent on the Gordon Elliott issue on Twitter. It's a position at the top of the moral outrage scale, given some other recent stories in Irish sport. And it does seem way off when put in that uh, context. Owen Murphy. Um, agree totally with Ryle about the moral outrage. The criticism of Elliot and off the ball Monday way over the top. The man's character torn apart before backtracking later in the week after they realised how bad uh. the initial reaction was. I would just say, on because I suspect you're talking about me there. Uh, the statement was, or sorry, the um, picture was criticised. I mean, everybody took a dim view of the picture. I would just say two things. The statement was obliterated, for sure, but I think it had to be. I don't think that could stand, and everybody, you know, there's things you have to stand up for sometimes and say, well, that's not right, and I felt that statement was not right. We couldn't just take that explanation as a version of what happened and say, well, that's that dealt with. And the fact that Elliot spoke to David Jennings and gave a totally different version of events and says it was a moment of madness, as opposed to the statement which said, oh, look, you don't quite understand what's happened here. I was the phone call and accidentally sad, and I was just gesturing to somebody that I was on an important call. I mean, I couldn't just come in here and say, that's fine. Like, he is also in a position of power, and there are horses under his charge, so that had to be called out. His character was not torn apart, actually. Um, and if you go to the YouTube video, 23 minutes into that YouTube conversation on Monday, hit play there, uh, I make the point he's having a horrible time, this is about the worst week of his life, and there has to be a place for forgiveness, and there has to be a way back for him. And then Johnny and Richard Forstall, Johnny Ward and Richard Forstall, both talked at length then about the quality of care he's renowned for giving animals at the yard. So that's what I'd say back to that. Um, look, it's, it's tricky, and 
you know, I, I accept he's had a horrible week, but at the same time, on Monday, with that picture and that statement, I mean, there had to be criticism, is all I'd say back. Agreed. But you're more than welcome to tweet in that opinion, absolutely. But that's, that's what I'd say back to it.